Welcome. Here we go on the second problem in the Computer Science 121 2013 Winter 2 Practice Final Exam. Quantifier order and the challenge method. Consider the following theorem, and there's a big nasty theorem that I'm not going to read through quite yet. Imagine using a direct proof approach to prove this theorem, so no contradiction, no contrapositive, no other use of logical equivalences to alter the form of the theorem. I'm just going to approach it in as straightforward a manner as I can, maybe according to our proofs guideline sheet. For each quantifier, indicate whether I will prove the quantifier or assume it prove the quantifier. This is this is kind of unfortunate wording here. Uh, we, we don't prove quantifiers, we prove quantified expressions, but if we're abusing the terminology a little bit, you can imagine, for example, when I'm proving this whole theorem, the outermost operator is this quantifier right here. And so, in some sense, if you like, I'm proving that quantifier with some predicate on the inside that's actually this whole piece of the statement here, this whole sub-expression in the theorem. So I'm just going to assume whoever wrote this exam, that's, that's what they intended by that unfortunate choice of terminology. Um, so let's just take that off. So we're going to indicate whether we're proving the quantified expression or we're assuming the quantified expression. If we're proving this particular quantified expression, indicate whether we get to choose the variable's value, and if so, on the basis of which other variables. If we're assuming this quantified expression, give an example of how we might make use of the assumption. OK. Well, we're proving the entire theorem. So until I come across a point where I'm going to be making an assumption, I'm not going to be assuming any of these quantified expressions. I'm going to be proving any, everything until something tells me to do otherwise. So I'll start with the first one, and I'm just going to write down fragments, just the, the quantifiers, so that I can remember what I'm working on here. I'm going to assume that z is the integer, so I'll draw it with a little double line. So this is just this fragment of the expression. This is not an expression itself, it's just the quantifier. It's just to help me remember that I'm working on this part of the theorem here. So in terms of that little quantifier there, I am proving it. Proving that quantified expression. And do I get to choose it? Yes, yes, I do get to choose it. Because it's an existential. And because I'm proving that existential. Okay, and um, what was the other question? Proving the quantifier, whether I get to choose the variable's value, and if so, on the basis of which other variables. Well, I haven't even touched any of the other variables, so the answer at this point is I don't get to choose this on the basis of any other variables. No other variables, none. Okay, let's move on to the next one. We've got a universal for all y in, and I'm going to assume this n is supposed to be the natural numbers here. Okay, so I'm, if I were actually proving this, I'd use a without loss of generality approach on it. I certainly do not get to choose y. That's what without loss of generality means. It means y is some natural number, but I don't know which one. It's an arbitrary natural number. So I am proving this quantified sub-expression. I am not going to get to choose for myself what the value of y is, so it doesn't matter what variables I could base my choice on, since I have no choice. OK, so now I need to find the outermost operator. And this is going to be a little tricky. There's a bunch of parentheses here. So open parenthesis, open parenthesis, uh, open parenthesis, close, close. So this matches that right there. And I've still got this parenthesis open. So open parenthesis, open parenthesis, close. So this matches that right there. Actually, let me put that on top. And then I'll put on bottom what, uh, what matches the one I still haven't closed. OK, and then I've got a closed parenthesis. So this is one expression, which means the outermost operator is actually this conditional arrow here. That's important. If the outermost operator were the AND, then what I'd say is, oh, I'm going to prove this, and then I'm going to prove whatever else is attached to the AND here. But the AND is not the outermost operator. I am not working on the AND yet. 
I haven't gotten there yet. I'm working on this conditional. And for conditional, I'm going to assume the left-hand side in order to prove the right-hand side. So now I've gotten to an assumption. And the left-hand side is all of this right here. It's everything in here. So I am assuming that sub-expression, and that includes both of the quantified sub-expressions inside. So my next two quantifiers for all z in the integers and exists a w in the natural numbers, I am assuming those quantified sub-expressions. I'm assuming an and here, so that means I'm assuming this part, and I'm also assuming that part. So I'm assuming these two quantified sub-expressions. And that means that I am assuming this universal right here. And if I'm assuming, I'm supposed to give an example of how I might make use of the assumption. When I assume a universal, I have a lot of power. I am assuming that every single integer has this property here uh, with x and y. So for every integer z, the p property holds with x and y. That's a, that's a big assumption. I could plug in any integer I wanted and still know that this is true. Uh, over here I'm assuming an existential. That's a much weaker assumption. I'm not assuming that this q, x, y, w thing is true for every single natural number. I'm assuming that there's some natural number it's true for, and maybe there's more, but I don't know what natural number it might be true for. So I'm going to have to figure that out. Okay, so I'm supposed to give an example. Uh, so as an example for z, uh, I could pick an integer and say, uh, let me make myself a little more room here, and say p of x, y, and that integer is true. Okay, oops, let me go back up just a little bit so we can see the whole theorem up there. Okay, now I'm assuming this existential up here, that is assuming. And what's an example of how we can use this? Well, I can't say anything more, anything more specific. More specific than... Um, Q of x, y, w. I don't know anything more specific than that. So, in fact, uh, I, I, I get to pick x. So at this point, I know might know precisely what x is. but uh, So I could fill this in, but I don't know anything more about w. I can't fill in a value for w the way that I could over here. By the way, one other thing. It didn't ask what I could choose a variable's value based on for my assumptions. But over here, where I assume the universal, I could even choose z on the basis of x and y. I could say, for instance, that when z is equal to y, p of x, y, y is true, because I know that this is true for every z. Uh, oh, and can I make z equal to y? Well, y is a natural number, z is an integer. So no matter what y is, I can make z equal to it if I want to. So I could say p of x, y, y here is true. Uh, these universals are very powerful when I assume them. They're very hard to prove. Once you've done a lot of work to prove something, you've got a fact that's very, very useful. Now, we didn't prove this fact here. We just assumed it. But that's okay. The structure of our theorem makes it all right to assume it. So now I've reduced my theorem down to just this piece right here. And there's nothing else exciting going on in this piece. So we've got this existential here. I am proving that, that existentially quantified expression. So I'm proving it. Uh, and do I get to choose it? Well, yeah, I get to choose that variable's value because this is an existential. And what do I get to choose A based on? Well, I get to choose A based on all the variables that I've set up so far. So, you know, do I get to choose it based on X? Well, I get to choose both of these. So, yeah, certainly I get to choose it based on X. 
Uh, but I can also choose it based on Y, even though I don't know what Y is. I can choose it based on Z if I want to, but again, I get to choose what Z is anyway, so that's not so important. I get to choose it based on W. I don't know what W is, but that's okay. I could choose, well, we don't know what this set A is, but let's say that A is the even numbers. Well, I could choose this lowercase letter A to be the next larger even number after W if I want to. I don't know what W is, but I can choose A on the basis of it. So I, I'm just going to say, uh, well, I was going to say all preceding variables, but let me make this clear. I can choose it on the basis of X, Y, Z, and W. But not on the basis of B. I haven't chosen B yet. I haven't said anything about B yet. And so I can't choose A on the basis of B. And that leaves us with one last quantifier for all B in A. And then the rest of the quantified expression here. Am I proving this? Yep, this is my sub-expression that is what's left of my theorem, so I am proving it. Do I get to choose this? No, it's a universal. I do not get to choose it. I have to prove this without loss of generality. I just know B is an element of A. I don't know which element. I could not, for example, choose it to be equal to A because I don't know what B is. Nor could I have gone back and chosen A on the basis of B to say A was equal to B because, as I said before, I don't have B available at that point. So I'm just going to have to live with that and prove this remaining predicate here without that information. And that is it.